Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Susan Howards, a local criminal defense attorney with a focus on family violence. And this is the Safety Net, Brookline Interactive Group's show dedicated to domestic violence and family violence. But during COVID, we have expanded the issues that we cover. And today we have a very special guest. He has been here before, Jerry McDermott former sheriff of Norfolk County. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you, Susan. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Because your resume is quite extensive. Well, sure. Um, well, since we're talking to mainly a Brookline audience, uh, I'll let them know that I grew up in neighboring Alston, Brighton. Uh, that's where I was born and raised and served on the Boston City Council, first as a legislative aide to uh, Bruce Bowling, uh, the late, great Bruce Bowling. And then uh, I served myself as a Boston City Councilor uh, from 2002 through 2008. Uh, and then after that, I uh, became um, the Executive Director of South Shore Habitat for Humanity. Uh, then after that, I went on to be the State Director for US Senator Scott Brown. Uh, then I joined the Baker Administration as a Chief of Staff at DCAM, which is the Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance and then I was tapped to fill out the um, unexpired term of former Norfolk County Sheriff Michael Bellotti. And uh, that was a great honor to serve as a sheriff of Norfolk County um, up until this most recent election. And uh, right now, what I'm doing is working as vice president of government affairs for a group called ARC National or ARC Behavioral Health, which has four facilities in Massachusetts that deal with mental health issues and uh, addiction issues. Uh, related to alcohol and uh, drugs. So it's a very fulfilling work and um, I, I kind of blend all of those life experiences together um, in this role right now. And thanks for having me, Susan. Oh my goodness, my pleasure. And on this Valentine's Day, you're also a single dad with two daughters. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. <laughs> One is in college or both are in college? So my oldest is a second semester sophomore at Emerson College in Boston. Uh -huh. And my youngest, is still looking at colleges. And uh, next week, we're actually going to Washington, D.C. to walk around Georgetown. And then we're heading down to Virginia to James Madison University and Virginia Tech. Very so exciting. Made but, up her mind yet. but very busy for dad on the road, right? And what do you do with the dogs? So uh, my older daughter will stay home with the two dogs, Sandy and okay. Finn, and the cat Mooney. And uh, and uh, we can't take them on a road trip. The last time we took the, the puppy on a road trip, it was a disaster. I'm sure, I'm sure. Oh, a lot of pit stops. For the puppy, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Jerry, as sheriff, what kinds of programs did you have for those who abuse, in other words, the batterers? And did you do any outreach to the victims? I still use the word victim because I think it has more punch um, and survivor to me means a shipwreck, although it is a shipwreck. So anyway, what kind of programs did you institute? So Susan, uh, working as the Norfolk County Sheriff, we had uh, a vacancy with our uh, victims advocate or victims coordinator within the sheriff's office. That person liaisons with the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office and their victim advocate. So you can imagine when I found that that was vacant, I knew there was a huge lack of communication. So we, we moved to fill that right away. And we really did partner well with the Norfolk County DA to make sure that uh, victims or survivors of um, domestic violence knew when the abuser was going to be headed to court. Um, now, as far as programming, we found the most effective was um, kind of an immersion that touched on um, uh, behavioral issues with the key among those being anger management. Now, we found some reluctance on the part of the abusers. Um, those who were pre-trial rather than sentenced, the pre-trial population, it would be to them almost an admission of guilt to take any kind of um, a class like that. And I, I think that many of their um, attorneys were kind of hesitant, yes, to say, um, <laughs> well, you haven't, you haven't admitted to the guilt yet. Let's go through the process and see what's going to happen. One thing that shocked me, though, and I think it's important, as, as sheriff, you know, we have the phone set up uh, so that attorneys such as yourself can call clients. And when you call any sheriff's office, you'll hear a recording that'll say, um, this call may be recorded. If, it, right. if it's an attorney call, please hang up and call a specific number. 
So even with the phone calls being recorded, we found that the abusers were threatening over the phone to their victims. And one of the most stunning things I saw was a mom coming up with a little toddler until probably three, four years old to put money into their, uh, the account of the abuser uh, so that they could purchase things from the commissary. And the, the kinds of calls, uh, I won't get too graphic, but the kinds of calls we got were, were threatening in nature that if you don't come up and put money on my account, you know what could happen when I get out or I could send somebody to your house. So Wait, um, if there's a restraining order, Jerry, that would be considered a third part a violation of a restraining order. Yes. And apparently your guests didn't care, did they? They don't care. They did not care. They did not care. Right. And, and what we also found was a lot of times the people in the care and custody of the Norfolk County Sheriff, um, those who were sentenced may have pleaded to something else. Um, you know, it gets down to maybe a simple assault, um, uh, trespass, you know, a combination of things, but somehow they, did, they didn't want to have domestic violence, that tag on them, uh, but it is prevalent. And I'm sure that you've seen in your work, Susan, as, as an attorney, that within, you know, the last two years during the COVID-19 pandemic, yes. we, we've seen an epidemic of domestic violence. It's sadly always been there, but it just seems to be out of control and uh, more frequently in the news. And the statistics in the United States, which you know all too well, uh, one in four females, one in nine males um, will be a victim. And it's uh, something to the effect of, uh, is it one person every 20 minutes or, yes. or higher? Yes. Yeah, yes. Well, about one person every 20 minutes is, is a, a, a victim of intimate partner abuse. Right, so, right. I think you know, that, I do. Yeah. I do want to pick up on something that you sure. said as a defense attorney. When my clients were sentenced to Norfolk County House of Correction, because I do a lot of work in Norfolk County, they were not willing to admit that they were batterers, and yes. that was a condition of the program, say Emerge or the other programs that they were in. So if they were on probation and they hadn't been committed yet to your guest house. Um, if they didn't admit that was a violation and that was something that caused a lot of conflict mm -hmm. um, for the attorney, for the court, and also for the batterers. But I just wanted to point that out. So I don't know what we can do about that because um, I've reached the point where, as you say, there is such an uptick in domestic violence across the nation, I, probably the world. At this point, I just wanted to stop with my clients. I don't care if they admit, just stop it. Put a break on, get yourself out of the experience of this, just stop it because they're not going to, many of them are not going to admit they're, they're really hardcore. They need uh, probably the services of art. But I want to ask you a question. How has COVID affected everybody's mental health? Not sure. just batterers, yours, Susan, mine, everybody. Susan, great question. Um, I, I think we've all seen that this COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated people's mental health issues, particularly our children, the social and emotional well-being of our kids has taken a hit, um, but also for, for all of us, for adults too. Um, I, I, I know family members who suffer depression or anxiety, it's gotten worse, it's gotten worse. And I've had um, uh, uh, friends, my, my neighbors reach out to me and ask if I knew of counselors or therapists, and my God, you can, you can call five, six, a dozen, and there, all these therapists will say to you, we just can't take on any more clients. So that tells you, uh, number one, it's a good thing people are looking for help to, to talk to a counselor right. or a therapist. Right, right. But, but the issue is there's not enough to go around. And through telehealth, there's been some good um, appointments and that works for some people. But it, it just shows that we as human beings are, are fragile and um, we, we all have some I think everyone has some form of, of mental health issue um, and could benefit from speaking to a counselor or therapist. I, I even say to my own two daughters, look, Tom Brady has somebody he calls a life coach, right? And that's really, that's really his, his um, go-to counselor who, who's helped him in his career. But it's affected those with addiction issues, with anger issues, those who have been batterers in the past. It's really impacted them. And so I think that is why we've seen not just an uptick in domestic violence, but violence in general across the country 
is truly out of control right now. It, you have to, you know, it, I could put on the news, whether it's TV or radio, or, or you look on the internet, but after a while, it's very, so negative, the news, you have to shut it off and you have to wonder what could we do, be doing better as a society? To what can we be curb? doing better? What can we be doing better, Jerry? Any thoughts? I, I do. I think a lot of it, um, and this might sound very simple, but I think a lot of it is the way we socialize our young men and the way they're raised. So for example, I, I'm the youngest of 10. Uh, I, adored, I adored my mom. Uh, she was a wonderful mom and I had five sisters. And I recall learning at a very young age with, with a good crack on my backside from my mom um, that even joking around at horseplay, you never, ever strike a woman. Um, because, you know, my sister, who was about five years older, and I were, were um, joking around in, in horseplay, and she had hit me, and I think I went to kick her in the shins. <gasps> I didn't, because I got a wallop on the backside and a talking to, and my mom said, you don't, as a gentleman, ever raise your hand. You never kick or hit a woman ever. Not even kidding, not even, you know, horseplay. Mm -hmm. and, and that stuck with me. And I just love my five sisters and my mom. And, and I, you know, I really think it was a great benefit the way I was raised. Now, but there's a lot of great guys out there, a lot of great women. They, they had the benefit of a good home and a good upbringing. I think that as the social fabric has been torn and, um, and our families aren't, you know, what they once were. I think that you've got a lot of young people almost raising themselves. And um, sadly, there's a lot of lost, lost, angry young men out there. And they, they in turn, don't know how to behave and have healthy relationships. So what can we do? I think getting into the schools early with a, with mm -hmm. a program uh, that talks about healthy relationships and I'd be remiss if I didn't give credit to um, our Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito. She did focus on this during her tenure with Governor Baker around um, sexual violence, domestic violence, and healthy relationships. We need more of that, more robust programming in the schools. And Susan, at an early age, because we have to be honest, our kids are interacting, shall we say, with each other at a much younger age, yep. fifth grade, sixth grade. We can't wait till high school. This has got to start around fifth and sixth grade. Jerry, um, you're absolutely right. And I'm just going to jump in because it's a perfect sure. opportunity. In Brooklyn, I know you know about this program. We had school resource officers yes. in the schools. Lo and behold, I believe in 2020, with no notice to the parents, they were booted out. Yeah. There's a group in Brookline that felt that it was the school to prison pipeline and cops shouldn't be in the schools. Uh-uh. We had a fabulous program put on by right. um, our police department called the AWARE program. Exactly mm -hmm. what you were talking about. Healthy relationships, bullying, sexting, which is prevalent in the schools. It's, How to look terrible. at the, the red flags. And as um, DA Morrissey said, and he is really, really strong as you are on domestic violence and batterers. He said, you know, most of the towns in Norfolk County would kill for a program like that. That's right. Poor use of words. And you had it and you got rid of it. We're trying now to get it back in, but you're absolutely right. We need some sort of education. And given the fact that the courts are so backlogged now, I can assess that. Yes. How can you help victims of domestic violence or kids who get into trouble, bullying or sexual harassment? What can we do? The court back up is astronomical. So I think that most district attorneys, including uh, DA Morrissey and uh, most sheriffs would probably agree that when, where, wherever there's the opportunity to rehabilitate somebody and have a diversion uh, towards programming, whether it's drug addiction, mental health issues, um, everyone's all for that, right? We're, we're not looking to incarcerate people. However, there are those who uh, time after time have proven that the only way they're going to learn some new behaviors is frankly when they are in the care and custody of the county sheriff. And that's sad, but um, you're right about the courts being backlogged. That oh. is a major, major problem. But what we can do is what the new nonprofit that I've um, helped to found is called uh, Reverse Pattern. Mm -hmm. And we're not trying to be the only nonprofit. We know there's other great ones out there like uh, Dove, for example, Domestic Violence Ended. We wanna work with other stakeholders um, whether they be state legislators, 
advocates such as yourself, uh, you know, experienced attorneys, other nonprofits, raise awareness about what can be done to educate our young people, reform people who are already uh, uh, abusers, and help the domestic violence survivors and their children. And that's really what the mission is all about, because the ripple, the negative ripple effect that it has when young men and women, young boys and girls, see the way that the, the male role model in their life treats, uh, oftentimes it's the male, um, it's the dad beating up their mom. They see that and all too often, those young men, those young boys will grow up to young men who will model that horrible behavior. And that's the kind of relationships we don't wanna see happen. We don't wanna see it perpetuated. So we want to do something, and that's why it's called reverse the pattern. We mm -hmm. wanna see those young people change the trajectory of their life and learn that that was not the way a, re a healthy relationship is supposed to be. So we all you know, can do something. Yeah, I'm familiar with reverse patterns and I, it's a little bit different from the other um, nonprofits in the domestic violence world. And it's, um, it's really, really special, particularly to me. It's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that it really focuses on the children Yes. Um, of the of the victim and the batterer, because oftentimes the kids don't understand and all of a sudden the home is dissolved. They're not living in the home. They may be living in a van. They may be living, living with grandma. And their concern is, how am I going to get to soccer practice? How am I going to get to hockey practice? How am I going to get to my piano lesson? And maybe mom doesn't have any money. That's right. For the, so is reverse. I think reverse patterns is going to focus on the kids to make sure that their lives are disrupted as little as possible. Am I correct? Because this is something new. 100%, Susan. It, it is so sad when you see that these kids are really victimized again and again. Okay, so it's bad enough that they, they may have gotten a beating or, or mom has been abused and now um, their father figures out of the house. Maybe he's incarcerated, um, mm -hmm. but maybe he's just out of the house. They don't know where he is. Um, they have a, a range of emotions, a roller coaster of emotions, but yet they are, they're hurt again and again. Every time mom says, no, we can't buy skates. You're not going to be on the ice hockey team. We don't have money for piano lessons or tennis lessons. You right. can't do what the other kids in the school district are doing because we have been left um, so financially harmed. You, right. your, your life for the foreseeable future is going to be awful. And we have to do something about that because all we're doing is breeding that kind of um, anger in those young right. boys and girls. So I think reverse pattern is special in that it's, it, very um, special. it's, it's going to focus on how we can lift those kids up, partner exactly. with other stakeholders and make a big difference in their life. In their lives. And one last thing recently, um, there was a bill presented by Lieutenant Governor Polito and Governor Baker, and this is not a political show, but this is a very important bill, the revenge porn bill. Yes. I happen to have a case where the um, victim is a victim of revenge porn, and there's not much we can do except file a harassment charge. Do you want to talk a little bit about what revenge porn is and what sure. this bill is aiming to do? Because this is really important. Th this is really taking um, uh, national... Um, the national stage, if you will. I mean, revenge porn has become so widespread that um, something has to be done about it. Here in Massachusetts- What is it, Jerry? Well, what is revenge sure. porn? What it is, um, so two intimate partners, consenting adults, um, may share uh, pictures or, or videos that they perhaps have made together, uh, or just, again, intimate uh, photos that were made for the eyes of just that person. Right. Maybe it's okay. a husband or wife, or long-term long partner, never to be seen supposedly by anyone else. Then the breakup comes or the domestic violence comes. And to be spiteful and to hurt that person, they'll post the photos, the intimate photos, the videos, and, and, and share them on the internet to hurt that person. Very, very deep wounds. And something's got to be done about it. Something must be done about that legally. And I, th I, I think that Governor Baker... Uh, and Lieutenant Governor Polito have spoken passionately about this legislation. Mm -hmm. And Speaker um, uh, um, Ray, um, sorry, Ron Mariano has said that he believes that it'll be taken up in the next few months. 
And if I could put it, if I could put in a plug, Susan, your listening audience could help by, okay, go on to uh, mass.gov, call the speaker's office, uh, call the main number of the state house and say that they want to see some action on the revenge porn legislation. That's all. Okay, let me just repeat, Jerry, go on to the website, mass.gov, M-A-S-S.gov. Call call the speaker of the house. And ask, um, and, and ask that they were want. They could also email their legislators. Correct. Correct. They could let. They, they could ask their local state representative. Um, in Brooklyn, I believe that's Tom. Uh, Tommy Vitello. Tom. Yep. Am I saying that correctly? And yes. and say so we really want to see action. We don't want this delayed. We want to see it passed this session. Um, you know, right now we have to keep the momentum up on this because it's it's hurtful and harmful enough. Um, the, the, the physical scars, the emotional scars, the financial wounds, but then to have, you know, that um, out there for the whole forever. world to see. Forever. forever. I can't get it off. Yeah. yeah. There's it's no terrible. way you can get it all out of the cloud. No, no. And, and, and I'll, I will share this with you. In, in Westwood, there was a young lady who shared pictures with a boy that she was in love with, and he asked her for photos. And she sent them, and it was only supposed to be for his eyes. And he shared them around. And that young lady committed suicide. <gasps> okay. And that was a number of years ago. It was a number of years ago. But this is the type of thing happening across the country with our young kids, uh, with adults. And I think it is one of the most rotten, despicable acts somebody could do. It's such a violation of somebody, someone's um, trust. So, um, I, again, I, I credit the governor, lieutenant governor. There's momentum on Beacon Hill. And if uh, your audience can get involved, again, we can all do something. But revenge porn, um, domestic violence, all of these things go hand in hand. And um, we're making headway, but it is a daunting task. And uh, we need everybody to help. As they say, many hands make light work. That's right. So, Jerry McDermott, on this Valentine's Day, what are your last thoughts for our audience? Well, I wish everybody a very peaceful and happy um, Valentine's Day. And if if you don't have uh, the love of your life with you, maybe it's your cat or your dog. I've got two lovely daughters and I've got two great dogs and a cat. So I'll spoil them rotten. That's what I'll do. But I hope everyone has maybe a nice dinner, um, even if they're dining alone or if they're dining with their pet. But uh, I would ask everybody to learn a little bit more about Reverse Pattern. And that's um, the website is www.reverse pattern and there's no space in between reverse and pattern.com and um you know an act of love would be getting involved and maybe helping people that you know and people that you don't know who are victims of domestic violence and their children particularly the children it's a great act of love and all it takes is a phone call or an email to your legislator on beacon hill to make a difference Jerry mcdermott thank you so much i hope you'll come back we relish your thoughts and your experience Thank you again, and thank you to Big for hosting this show. Bye, everybody. Until next time, Susan Howards.